We have so much stuff to talk about today that I actually had to make some crib notes. B -B -Q -plus. So, when you're a kid, I think that there are really only three days on the calendar that are important. You have Christmas and your birthday, which I was very lucky in that my birthday falls like right in the middle of the year. So I always felt bad for kids who had their birthday like a week or two from Christmas because you kind of can't help but get screwed a little bit on presents. You know, you can't ask for a Nintendo for Christmas and then expect to get like three or four games for your birthday or whatever. So I always felt bad for kids like that. Jonathan had that kind of situation, but he was a pretty spoiled kid, so uh, it wasn't a big deal. But anyway, so you had Christmas, you had your birthday, and then of course you had the last day of school. And uh, I feel like the older you get, the relative importance of those days kind of shifts. Like I think when you're a little kid, like in elementary school, Christmas and your birthday are a huge deal. And at least for me, like the last day of school, I didn't really care that much. Like that doesn't mean that I didn't, didn't enjoy summer, but, uh, but when you're a kid, I feel like school isn't really that big of a deal. Like I didn't hate school uh, when I was in elementary school, you know? I mean, that was my whole, my whole world. Like you spent most of your waking time at school. Like all my friends were there and you had the same teacher all day that hopefully you got along with. And you, know, you ate lunch in the cafeteria every day and then went out for recess, you know, and played Foursquare. We played a lot of nation ball, which is just dodgeball. And so the last day of school would be kind of this bittersweet thing because, you know, you are you were kind of leaving a lot of your friends. Like, you'd still see your good friends in the summer. But for that reason, when I was a kid, the last day of school just doesn't have that much importance to me. And I actually don't remember a lot of my last days of school. But then you get older, and the it, it the balance shifts the other way. Like when I was in high school, Christmas was cool because you had Christmas vacation, and that got me away from school. Because you know when you're in high school, unless there's something wrong with you, you hate school, and I certainly did. And so Christmas was cool because of Christmas vacation. My birthday I couldn't have cared less about, and then the last day of school was like the greatest day of the year, right? And, and now as like an old man, you know, uh, I, my birthday, I don't care. Uh, Christmas, I kind of don't care just because I don't have kids and we don't have like a big extended family. So I feel like when you're my age, you live Christmas like vicariously through your kids. And, you know, so for me, obviously, that, that's not going to happen. So Christmas for me, I don't really care. My birthday is just another day. But, you know, if I had a job, like if I was a teacher so that the last day of school was the last day of me having to work for three months, that would be like by far the greatest day of my year. Like I can't even imagine having the kind of job, and I totally get it that teachers have a very tough job. And everybody who doesn't know any better says, oh, you get the entire summer off. And like teachers try to explain like, yeah, but you know what they have to go through the other nine months, and I totally get that. But at the same time, the idea of being able to not work for like two and a half months or whatever the hell it is, I'd be willing to put up with a lot. Like think of the worst job you can think of, and I might be willing to do that if it meant I got two and a half months out of the year uh, off. I've been wanting to make this episode since like June because you know, whenever it's summer, it, I start feeling nostalgic because it reminds me of being a kid and enjoying summer as a kid. But uh, you know, then like the middle of July rolls around and you start seeing the ads in the newspaper and you start seeing the commercials on TV, you know, back to school sales. And those were just, I hated that because it's like, it's only July. Like my summer vacation is not even half over and you're starting in with this back to school crap. And it just used to, it's like this constant reminder of like, hey, your summer is gonna be over soon, you're back to school. And I used to hate that. I thought that was so mean to do to kids. I understand why they do it, of course, but. You know, so even when I see it now, it just makes me shake my head, you know, I, that sucks. Obviously, uh, we're in into 1988 now, the last episode we talked about, the spring of 88, and this would have been uh, the end of fifth grade for me, and I actually do remember the last day of school in fifth grade, uh, for kind of a stupid reason, I guess. So uh, a bunch of guys at school got together, and for some reason we had all decided that we were all gonna bring shaving cream to school for the last day of school, shaving cream. And I just, 
I don't know, spray stuff with it. I don't even really know what the point. I think some other kids were like, yeah, of course you bring shaving cream to school on the last day, duh. And I, and I was just like, oh, okay, you know. And so I just went home and asked my dad, like, hey, can I, can I have a can of shaving cream? And he's like, well, why? And I said, well, you know, a bunch of the guys at school, you know, a bunch of the fellows are bringing shaving cream to school and I need some. And, you know, most parents would have just been like, no. And so, you know, I told him, like, yeah, I need some shaving cream. You know, some of the guys at school want to bring shaving cream. And I think he was like, yeah, all right, you know, here you go. Here's your shaving cream, you know. And so, of course, I go to school, last day of school, and I'm the only kid that had this. Because they all probably went and asked their parents, too. And their parents was like, no, I'm not giving you a can of shaving cream. So I showed up with the cream, and, like, nobody else had it. And so it was just like the party was canceled. And so I just remember me and one of my friends walking home after school and we were walking through an apartment complex. And I think I mentioned already that in this neighborhood where I lived, there were just a lot of apartment complexes. And so I had a lot of friends that lived in and, and, and whatever. And so we were walking through this one apartment complex and I had my little can of shaving cream and just shake it up. And I'm just like putting shaving cream on things, which is stupid, but you know, I, I was just doing that. And then I remember like the apartment manager guy or whatever, like drives up in his golf cart and was like, hey, you know, cause, oh, cause we were also doorbell ditching, which, uh, for anybody that, I don't know if there's like international viewers, doorbell ditching is just you run up and you ring the doorbell or knock on the door and then you run and go hide. And so they open the door and there's nobody there. And it's, you know, when you're a little kid, somehow that's hilarious. But so probably somebody had called the manager and say, hey, there's some hooligans, uh, doorbell ditching in the complex. And so they came and found us and took away the can of shaving cream. So, um, that's a dumb story, but just for that reason, even though it's stupid, I, I remember the last day of school. Uh, of fifth grade. So, but anyway, the summer of 88 was a pretty memorable summer for me because kind of along the same lines of the last day of school not being a big deal, you know, you could ask me, what'd you do in the summer of 85 or 86? And I, I might kind of struggle to come up with some memories that I could specifically attribute to that summer. But uh, the summer of 88 was, was a pretty cool summer. So, you know, obviously we're living in a, a semi new house, new neighborhood because we had moved in like the late winter, or early spring. And uh, sort of the two things that really stick out in my mind from that summer are, uh, firstly, we bought a boat, which maybe sounds like, you know, like we, we didn't have my, I've mentioned it in the past, like growing up, we didn't have like money or whatever. And that's really true. But, you know, we had a very standard middle class uh, lifestyle. And I, I don't know if my dad got like a bonus at work or something, you know, but he found like a boat in the classified ads in the paper and, and just, he didn't even tell us anything. He says, they, you know, he just told me like one Saturday, Hey, you know, jump in the car. We're going to go look at this boat. And like, this was the first I'd heard of a boat. And, uh, it's just kind of funny because growing up, we never really went on any kind of trips, you know, like I had other kids at school that I knew who went to Hawaii or went to like Disney world or took like a week vacation, especially in the summer. And we literally never did that because we didn't really have the money for it but then somehow we have a boat. But it was kind of cool because, you know, one of the things we did a lot when I was a kid is we would go on day trips, like prior to the boat thing. And I mean, it was a pretty cool boat. It was like one of those cabin cruisers. And uh, I still remember the first time we ever took the boat out. Cause I think it must've been sometime in the spring when we actually got it, not in the summer. And uh, we got, like my dad didn't, you know, I, I, it was a learning experience for him, I guess. But we went out and got caught in a storm. Like maybe he didn't check the weather. And it was pretty bad. Like, you know, it was a lot of wind. We were in a really big waterway and there was a lot of wind and it started raining and, and we started getting pretty decent sized waves. And this was not that big of a boat. So the boat's kind of getting thrown around a little bit. And so he wanted to head back to the marina, you know? And so he's kind of like gunning it a little bit thinking the longer we stay out here, the worse it's gonna get. And so we're, he's going pretty fast, like on this waterway and there's these big waves. And so the boat is just like coming off of these waves and then like crash, not crashing literally, but coming in like smacking down onto the water. Like it would, it would go up and just like boom, boom, boom. Cause it would keep every single wave, boom. And I was like, I mean, I'm only 11 years old, right? But I'm just thinking like, man, like I feel like the, the boat's gonna like break. And it was bad enough that he told me like, take the dog and just go into the little cabin thing or whatever. Because I think he was afraid that either me or the dog were gonna get thrown out of the boat. I don't know where my sister was. Hopefully she wasn't with us. Um, so I remember going down there and of course now I'm in the very front of the boat, which has the most movement, you know, getting smacked around in these waves. 
And I just remember that me and the dog just both fell asleep. Like the boat's just like, bam, 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 fell asleep. And when I woke up, we were like in the marina and everything was all calm. And they were both just looking at me like I was crazy. Like, how the heck did you fall asleep? But uh, it was pretty funny. And I remember another time I took the boat out and he got it stuck because we were going down like this little, not a creek literally, but like a little tiny river. And you could literally get out and stand in the river and it wouldn't even be up to your, to your waist. And so, of course, the boat got stuck. And we had to take it and push it back. He was a rookie, you know, he was still learning. But yeah, uh, eventually this just became a weekly thing. Like every weekend we were out on the boat, we'd go fishing or, you know, we'd go to some other area or we could, you know, drop anchor and just like wade into the shore and like hang out on the beach. Like there were just tons of things to do where we lived if you had a boat. So hopefully he got his money's worth or felt like he got his money's worth out of it. But that was a lot of fun. So we did a lot of that that summer. And then the other thing I remember from that summer is that this neighborhood we lived in had a community pool, a really cool one too. It, it had like a big pool, like a lap pool, that had a deep end of shallow, but really big pool. And then there was also this man-made lake that was like lined with houses and, and apartment buildings and whatnot. But then they had put in like this man-made beach. But like the lake was kind of gross because it was totally enclosed, right? It, it didn't have like a river running into it or anything like that. And so it was just stagnant water and so it was kind of like murky and, you know, you'd, you'd get out and you'd kind of smell funny. But um, you had access, you'd pay like a dollar to get into the community pool. And then you had access to both. Like you'd pay the dollar at the booth and then you walk in. And if you went one way, you went to that beach thing. And if you went the other way, you'd, you'd go to the pool area. And so we used to go back and forth a lot because you'd like to go into the beach and kind of play around in there. But then you'd feel kind of gross. So you'd run, you'd run across and jump in the pool to, to kind of wash all that crap off. And, and, like, they had a snack bar, so, you know, you'd, you'd go over there and get, like, nachos or whatever. And um, so I used to go over there literally every day. Uh, I would ride my bike because I, I think, you know, both my parents, my, my dad and my stepmom, they worked. So they left every morning. And my sister was, like, three. Like, she turned three that summer. And so they took her to, like, one of those Montessori school things, like a daycare. And so I was just home alone all day every day. So... And I had made a couple of friends in the neighborhood, but, you know, I was relatively new in the neighborhood, so I didn't have, like, you know, super best friends or whatever. So uh, I would just go to the pool every day, and I just made friends with the kids at the pool, and so they would just leave me a dollar or two every day, and I'd ride my bike over there. And the other thing I remember about the pool is that they had a ping pong table. And I got really into kind of playing ping pong with the other kids, because, I mean, how much can you swim, right? And so I remember telling my dad that, you know, I was playing all this ping pong at the pool, and, like, my dad thought that was cool. Like I, like I said about the shaving cream, my, I think my dad was just trying to get me to be into like something. Like I think ideally he would have liked it if I had gotten into sports. But honestly, like the way he was, anything I showed like any interest in, he was like trying to like push me to just, just to be supportive to try to get me to do it. Like I remember when I got into baseball and like that birthday, I got like a, you know, baseball mitt and a ball and like two bats and then he got me one of those like net things that you can throw a ball at and it'll bounce back at you. And, um, but it wasn't just limited to like sports. Like I remember for some reason, I don't, I don't remember exactly when this was, but it would have been before 88. Like for some reason I got into stamps. Like, I don't know how that happened. I must have, maybe I just started cutting the stamps out of the mail we would get just because I thought they were cool. I don't, I don't really know. I don't remember, but I just got into stamps somehow. And so my dad like stopped at a hobby store one day on, on the way home from work and bought me like a stamp album. And then, you know, he got like a couple of these, you used to have to buy these bags full of stamps. They were like stamps from around the world or something that were like worthless for whatever reason, but you know, they were just kind of cool to look at. So I remember, you know, he got me those and I sorted them all out. And I mean, it doesn't matter, but my point is just that anytime I showed interest in something, my dad would, you know, always try to be supportive and like bring me stuff or whatever to, to you know, push me to maybe get more into it. And so I tell him like, yeah, I'm playing ping pong uh, down at the pool. And so he comes home one day with a ping pong paddle. Because maybe I had mentioned, you know, they just had like the standard ping pong paddles that had like that, this stuff stuck on it that was like sandpaper with the little nodules all over it or whatever. And like they were starting to peel off. And I mean, they were, they were crappy ping pong paddles. And so I told him that. And so he, he went to like the sporting goods store and came home with like this good ping pong paddle. Like, here, now you have a good one you can take with you. But then, you know, and his heart was in the right place. But like then I go down there. And everybody's like, why do you have your own ping pong paddle? Like, you're not even good. Like, you know, I got made fun of. And then, like, all that would happen is then other kids wanted to use my paddle because, you know, it was their turn. Hey, man, let me use your paddle. I was like, you know, whatever. So, um, 
But I used to go down there every single day, and uh, I had a lot of fun doing that as well. For me, when I think of summer as a kid, and the thing, you know, the thing is, I, I had half a mind to just make a separate episode and just talk about, like, the summer vacations of my youth. But there was not really any way to tell, like, a story that had any cohesion to it. It would just be me, you know, incoherently rambling off, you know, disconnected memories or whatever. But uh, one of the things that I remember when I was a kid, and it's probably still the case today, is, you know, during the summer you had, like, the blockbuster movies... And then you had like the, the music, like there would be like whatever were the hot songs that summer. And, you know, probably the number one song I, I think of when I think of that is Summertime by uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And I want to say that was 1990, but I'm not positive. But, you know, every summer that was the case, you know. And so I actually looked up on, on the Billboard's website, like what were the hot songs uh, of that summer. I'll just go through them quickly. And I, you know, I wish I could show you like clips or play little clips of the songs, but you know, I worry about getting a, a copyright strike or something, so I apologize. I understand that, that would make this a better video, but uh, it's not really worth the risk. So uh, we had, uh, the first one, this was the most popular song in the summer of 88 was Roll With It by Steve Winwood, which, I mean, I know the song, but was it really that popular? Like when I think of Steve Winwood, I actually think back to the summer of 86, because that was the first summer that we had cable TV. And uh, the two big channels I always watched on cable were MTV and Nickelodeon. And that summer, like the two songs that got played uh, nonstop on MTV were uh, Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel, which had an awesome video, and then Higher Love by Steve Winwood. So that's, I think, more of like that era when I think of Steve Winwood. So I'm kind of surprised he had the number one song in 88. Uh, number two was The Flame by Cheap Trick. Number three was Monkey by George Michael. Uh, the album it came off of was, was Faith, which I actually had that. I had the cassette tape of that album uh, when I was a kid. In the spring of 88, I guess I should have mentioned this in the last episode. I shouldn't have mentioned it at all. It's not really a big deal. But I actually had surgery in the spring of 88. I, I had surgery on my eye, like pretty major surgery. And I was, you know, I was at that time still 10. I hadn't turned 11 yet. And it's pretty scary to have, you know, I mean, I had like general anesthesia and everything. I had to go all the way to San Francisco. To, to have the surgery done, and obviously I was really scared. We listened to it like nonstop in the car on the way there, like while we were there on the way home, and so uh, that George Michael album has kind of a, a special place for me just because uh, I don't want to go as far as to say it got me through a rough time, but I mean, kind of did, I guess. Uh, number four was Hold On to the Night by Richard Marks. I've never liked Richard Marks. Now, number five, this is a good one. Now, I wasn't into this kind of music. I should say that because of my age, I, I didn't really have my own musical tastes outside of like Weird Al Yankovic or something, but um, I pretty much just listened to whatever my parents listened to. But they, of course, listened primarily to like adult contemporary music, and so that's just what I had to listen to. Now with my mom, it was all like new age jazz, and that's a whole separate thing. But, but you know, so when I think about like these summers and listening to music, it was mostly listening to like the, the kind of adult contemporary stuff that they would listen to. And so number five, Pour Some Sugar On Me by Def Leppard, awesome song, but I'd be lying if I said I, that we were listening to it or that I remember it from that summer. Actually, I remember, was that, I think that album was Hysteria. I remember buying that tape off of a kid in the sixth grade for 50 cents. That was a sweet deal. Uh, so then I listened to it, but cool song. And then I kind of wrote down like an honorable mention because this is a song I definitely remember from that summer. Uh, and that is Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley, you know, the, the Rick Roll song. Um, that was certainly very popular. Now, that song was actually released in the fall of 87, but didn't hit number one on the charts until March of 88. So obviously by summer it was still very popular. And uh, just for fun, I pulled up the video on YouTube. And that's, of course, the video that everybody links to when they're trying to Rick Roll somebody. And it's got like 340 million views. Which just makes me wonder, like, how much money did Rick Astley make off of the whole Rick Rolling thing? Because, yeah, you know, 340 million views, that's a lot of views. But then on top of that, you wonder, like, how many people ended up downloading that song off of iTunes just because, like, that kind of brought it back into the limelight. So, I mean, good for him, because that, that was a good song. But, uh, yeah, anyway, so those are the songs, and it's, my point in bringing those up is... None of those songs are really that super memorable for me. You know, when I think of, like I said, going back to having MTV in 86 and like Sledgehammer 
and Higher Love or uh, Danger Zone by um, mm, Kenny Loggins. Man. Uh, yeah, so like they, that uh, video got played a lot on MTV and that had like the footage in it from Top Gun. And there were a few others, you know, like uh, The Hunter by GTR, which uh, isn't really popular. Nobody's, nobody remembers that song, but that got played a lot back then. And uh, so to me, like those are like these iconic summer songs, but 88 I thought was kind of weak. And then I also looked up the movies of 88, like what were the blockbuster movies of 88? And uh, I wrote down five, but I only saw two of them in the movie theater, I believe. I might have seen three. And uh, Rambo 3, I definitely didn't see in the movie theater because I've actually never seen that movie. But uh, that one came out that summer and then Die Hard. And I'm pretty sure I didn't see that one in the movie theater. Die Hard would go on to be a movie that my dad and I would watch together. Like, we both really liked Die Hard. And, but I think I saw that one when it came out on home video. And, uh, but I remember he and I went and saw Die Hard 2 in the movie theater when that came out. Uh, and then the last one is Willow. And I'm pretty sure I didn't see Willow in the movie theater. But, uh, I mean, I've definitely, I've seen the movie many times. I have no recollection of seeing it in the movie theater. Now, the two movies I definitely saw in the movie theater are big. The, uh, the Tom Hanks movie, you know, Tom Hanks, he's like a 13-year-old kid who's like a little bit sort of slight of build for his age. So he goes to one of those like animatronic, uh, like fortune-telling machines, which I think I talked about in the first episode of Flashback because they had some of those at that Sam's Place arcade. So, you know, he goes and he wishes, like, I wish I were big. And then he wakes up the next morning and he's Tom Hanks. And uh, it was a pretty cool movie. I liked it a lot. Uh, the other movie I remember seeing movie theater in 88, summer of 88, was uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And uh, that was a big, that was the number one movie that summer. Uh, you know, the big deal with that movie was that it, it had, you know, animated characters sharing the screen with live action characters, which had certainly been done before, but I think maybe not to this level. Like the, the quality, like it was very believable. What was that dragon movie? Pete's Dragon. Uh, the old Disney movie, like they did stuff like that. And there are plenty of other examples of movies trying to have cartoon characters sharing the screen with real people that just wasn't as believable. But with this movie, it was really believable. And uh, so I liked that movie a lot. And I remember I even got, they had a, a stuffed Roger Rabbit toy that you could get, you know, like maybe like that tall, where you could hit like a pull string. And then he would say, I, I don't remember a single thing he said, but you know, he would say one of, the, you know, one of his taglines or whatever. Uh, but anyway, okay, so where we lived, this neighborhood we lived in, we had uh, this older, like, retired couple that lived directly across the street from me. And they had this one grandkid, Stephen, and Stephen lived in the same town as I did. And he would often, like, during the school year, he would spend a lot of weekends at their house. And so then he and I would hang out uh, quite a bit. I would go over there a lot. You know, like I said, he'd bring his Nintendo... So I'd bring my Nintendo games over. And I think I, I mentioned uh, when I was talking about the disappointing video games and I talked about Akari Warriors, uh, I talked about the fact that I played it two-player with a friend and, you know, we got mad because, you know, we played forever and I got stuck or whatever. And uh, that was Steven. And I think that was probably the one time that we sat down and, like, tried to seriously play Akari Warriors. And I don't even play that one anymore after that. You know, of course, I, as I said before, I didn't really have games anybody wanted to play. So we mostly played Steven's games, although his were no prize either. And that's what we're going to get to. So, so I would go over to his house, and we would, I mean, we'd go to the pool together, or sometimes we would just go hang out outside. Like, I remember his grandfather had this old, like, 1960s, like, probably late 60s Ford Ranchero, which was like Ford's version of the El Camino. And they'd always be parked in his driveway, and we used to just go sit in the back of it. And, uh, but we used to play a lot of video games as well. And the three games, so that's the three games we're going to talk about today, uh, are these three games that Steven had that I used to play. And uh, two of them are sports games, and so we're just going to go over them fairly briefly. And then the third one is, a uh, well, whether you think it's good or not is up to you, but uh, certainly memorable. The first game was John Elway's Quarterback, and that was the first football game I ever played. And he was a Broncos fan, I think that's why he had the game, of course, John Elway, was, uh, was you know, very famous in the 80s. When you think about quarterbacks in the 80s, they were really three, like, superstar quarterbacks. Like, you don't have to be a, a super diehard football fan to know who, like, Joe Montana, Dan Marino, 
and uh, John Elway were. Like those three guys were like household names. And it's kind of funny because out of those three, the only one to win a Super Bowl was uh, was Joe Montana in the in the eighties. I mean, uh, Dan Marino went to one Super Bowl and lost to the 49ers. and then uh, John Elway, I think, went to a total of three Super Bowls that he lost before. You know, it wasn't until ninety seven and ninety eight, right before he retired, that he won the Super Bowls. Um, and then, of course, Joe Montana won uh, four Super Bowls in the eighties. The, the main thing I remember about that game was that. I would always pick uh, the shotgun play and then just throw a bomb up the right side and it would just be a touchdown pass every time. Like the game wasn't even fun because you could just do this one play, boom, touchdown. So we got tired of that pretty fast. You know, when you play games like that, or another one I would think of would be like Joe Montana football for the Genesis, games that are just really easy, really even the first John Madden football for the Genesis, it almost becomes this game of like, how big of a point differential can I have over their team because you know winning is like a given we didn't play that one that much and then the other sports game that he had was baseball just the the black label nintendo uh, baseball game and uh that game i also really didn't care for still it's, it's one of my most hated uh nintendo games really just because of my experiences playing it back then now baseball was a launch game for the nes but it's actually so old that it was a very early release on the Famicom. I think baseball came out in like 1983 uh, on the Famicom. So it's old game. And the main thing that I remember about baseball, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it, but the main thing I remember about baseball was that it was sort of my first experience with rubber band AI. Of course, we didn't call it rubber band AI. I don't think we even knew what AI was. Like back then, you would just say the computer was cheating. And uh, which it totally did in a lot of games, but certainly in baseball, like, you know, you'd go into the ninth inning with like a three or four run lead. And then, you know, the computer controlled team would be able to string enough hits together to beat you. And you'd just be disgusted. And certainly by 88, there were better baseball games out, but I hadn't played any of them. This was just, this is what Steven had. So we played baseball, but we didn't like it, but it's just like, you only have so many games, right? So you'd play one game, like I'm sick of that game and you put it in the next game. So Baseball got, you know, it's time in the rotation just because you got to play something. But uh, still to this day, I don't care for baseball. Now, the third game was uh, a game that was really hard at the time. And for that reason, we didn't care for it. But uh, it's kind of gone on to, you know, it's got a special place in my heart. And that is Ghosts and Goblins. And I already covered Ghosts and Goblins. I, I gave it its own review. Uh, I it got its own video over on the other channel. Now, the main thing I remember about it back then was just that it was so brutally hard, but that we didn't hate it. It wasn't like, oh, this game sucks. It's just you could, you could only take so much failing before you just didn't want to play anymore. And in fact, um, getting to the second level was an accomplishment anytime we played. And getting past the second level never happened when I was a kid. I never even got to the second level boss. I think the farthest I would ever get, the second level, you have those little platformy parts that you do where those little goblin things flying out of the doors, right? And then you go to the right and you jump down onto, onto more like the sidewalk. And then you go to the right and you have to work your way up this building and the, there's those big guys that like barf on you. And that's as far as we could ever get. Because you had the guys barfing on you and then you'd have like these bats or whatever flying through and we could never make it past that part. But we still enjoyed it. I mean, the game was cool. It had decent graphics. And it had a lot of atmosphere. Like the music in that game was great. But uh, one of the big problems with the game was it was really buggy. And it was really, it was just visual glitches. But, um, but it was just buggy in a way that it, it just looked really unfinished. And uh, the reason for that is that it's a Micronics game, which I mentioned in uh, the review video I did of it. And then of course we talked about Micronics in uh, the disappointing video games video. So. None of that really affected the gameplay, though. It's, I mean, the game played similarly the way it did in the arcade. Like, the controls are very stiff, and it's just a very difficult game. Really cool to play with the lights off, and, um, and it's, like I said, it has a special place in my heart now. That game I do have. Uh, but those were the three games that, that I remember playing in uh, the summer of 88. I've mentioned that at the end of the summer, 
I uh, moved back to my mom's house. And the reason I'm sta uh, saving the story for the end, well, first of all, it's putting it in proper chronological context, but also it kind of gives some people a chance to switch off. Like if you're not interested in this, uh, I totally understand and just, just, you know, switch it off. You know, it'd be easy for me to just say, yeah, I moved back to my mom's house at the end of the summer. But, you know, I, I feel like I need to convey how much of a big deal that was for me. I, and the reason for that, so I'm going to give some backstory. I don't know how long this story is going to be. I'm going to try to leave out as many details as possible that are just not important. But, you know, either, either be honest with your audience or you don't, right? So I don't have any memory of my parents being married. Like my dad left the house when I was like two. And so for as long as I could remember, they were just separated, but they lived in the same city. And I had a room at my mom's house and I had a room at my dad's house. And I just split my time. I don't know how they split the time, but I just, you know, I had some nights at this house, some nights at the other house. Halfway through second grade, my dad got a job uh, like three hours away. And my parents made the decision that I was going to go live with my dad. I was going to move with my dad, move away. And I don't know how or why they came to that decision, but, but that's what they decided. And I was seven years old, I guess, when this happened. And you know, when you're that age, you don't really understand like what, you know, what does that even mean or what, what's gonna be the consequences of that happening, right? Because you don't think that way. And so it's just like, oh yeah, your dad's gonna move and you're gonna go live with him. And, and of course this is where we moved was the place where Sam's town was. And so like, you know, and it was like this little town in the mountains and it was like an all wild west town. I'm like, you know, my dad tells me all this, and I'm like, oh, this sounds really cool, right? And so we move, move away. And, and it's only once you're, you're gone that I think you realize what has happened. And, you know, like I had gone to the same elementary school, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade. I had all my friends there. And, you know, I lived like seven houses down from my elementary school. So I walked to school every day. And, you know, I walked past seven houses. One of those houses was Jonathan's house, my best friend. And my grandparents lived like a block away because they had moved actually out to California when I was born because I was the only grandchild. And so moving away meant I was moving away from all of that. And on top of that, you know, I don't, I don't like to make stereotypes, but, you know, people say, you know, like, you know, little boys are like mama's boys. And little girls are like daddy's little girl. And I don't, I, don't, I don't have kids and I don't know how true that really is, but it was true in my case. Like I was always kind of a mama's boy. Uh, not to say I didn't love my dad, but it was just like I always felt closer to my mom when I was a kid. And so having to be kind of taken away from her ended up sort of uh, having a negative effect on me, which I didn't really think about when it happened, but it was just after being away. And I would go back and visit and everything, but it's not the same. And so the whole time that I lived with my dad and my stepmom, I, I was like just sad. I was like a sad kid. I don't want to say I was depressed. I don't know if it's possible for a seven-year-old to be depressed. I'm not saying they can't. I'm just saying I don't, you know, I don't know enough to say. But, um, but they took me to like a child psychologist. Like, oh, we don't know what's wrong. Our kid's mopey. Like my dad used to always say I was mopey. But that's why I was mopey is I wanted to go home. Like to me, that was going home. And... Um, and I used to be, I was pretty vocal about it. Not like, I want to go home, but I would just, you know, they knew I wanted to go home. And, you know, my mom probably knew that I wanted to go home too. But, and as I've mentioned multiple times previously, I didn't get along with my stepmother. I just don't, I don't want to go into too much detail, I guess. But, you know, because it's funny, I said the thing I said in the first or second episode about how my stepmom gave me all those He-Man toys and uh, because she was trying to bribe me or like, you know, buy my affection or whatever. And I actually got a private message from somebody uh, telling me, you know, you shouldn't have said that. That's like too personal information. Like, what if she sees that? Which I thought was funny. And I, and I know the person that sent me that message, I'm, I know, is watching this. And I believe me, I appreciate the concern, but it's really not a problem. Um, so as I was saying, I've just, I never liked my stepmom. And that was a big part of the reason that I want, like not only did I want to go be with my mom because I was closer to my mom, I couldn't stand my stepmom. And she wasn't abusive or anything. I just, I just, some people aren't cut out to be parents and that was her. So, um, in the summer of 88, uh, and this was the part like I didn't know how much detail, because the thing is if I just say like, yeah, you know, very suddenly I got to go live back with my mom, but it's a boring story so I won't tell you, then people are going to be wondering, well, what the hell happened? Like, did you know? Like, I wasn't being molested, I wasn't being abused. It was, um, you know how there's some people 
who can be, maybe they overreact to something or they can be wrong about something. And instead of saying like, whoa, I overreacted or whoa, I was wrong, their, their means of coping with the situation is to like ratchet things up to get you to be like, okay, whatever. Like, you know, you'll admit you were wrong when you weren't or whatever, just because the other person is like ratcheting everything up. That was my stepmom. And so that's why like this story is very stupid, but the end result was me moving back with my mom. And um, so just to give you just the broad strokes, uh, basically my stepmother lost something or well, something got stolen from us that she blamed on me ridiculously. Like, oh, this is because of something that you did and blah, 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 blah. And, um, and she wouldn't let it go. And, I was, and it was ridiculous. I said, no. And I knew what happened. I said, it was, you know, you left the, this open and somebody took it. And she wouldn't accept it because, like, she probably knew she was being unreasonable, but she's not going to let an 11-year-old tell her that she's wrong, right? And so, like, she ratchets things up. And so, like, she ended up, like, taking my bike away from me, taking my Nintendo away from me. Well, if you don't respect my stuff, you can't have all because she wouldn't admit that she was wrong. And I think my dad, like, my dad knew, you know, my dad tried to, I think, kind of guard me a little bit against my stepmom's kind of craziness, which, like I said, she wasn't abusive or anything. It was just like, you know, but, you know, this was kind of maybe going a little bit too far. And, and her whole thing was like, I want you to admit what you did. I want you to admit this was your fault. And I wouldn't, even though I was 11, I'm like, no, I didn't do this. And so she's taking all my stuff. And I just like put my foot down, was just like, no, like she, I, I was grounded. I couldn't go to the pool anymore. I couldn't go see my friends anymore. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't go anywhere anyway. I didn't have a bike. I didn't have my Nintendo. And um, and then like the worst part of it was like one time uh, my dad and I went over to uh, a friend of theirs house. Just he and I went over to see his friend because his friend had a kid that was my age that I was friends with. And we went over there to pick something up or something or I don't know. And th this guy knew about what was going on. And he's like, oh, so this happened and you did whatever, like, you know, assuming that it was my fault. And I just didn't want to talk about it. And I was just like, yeah, that was, you know, I'm just stupid. Or, you know, I forgot what I said. And then that gets back to my stepmom. So I heard you went over to Chip's house and admitted what you did. And it was just like, oh. So I tell my mom all this that's going on. And of course my mom doesn't like my stepmom. And a friend of my mom's happened to be up in our area. And she just basically said, you know, just pack up some stuff. And, you know, my friend is just going to bring you back to me. And so that's what happened. It all happened just very suddenly. And so like, I didn't even have, like, I just like packed up a duffel bag with some clothes, got my Nintendo back. And, uh, I had my little Casio, uh, what was it like an MT 100 keyboard or something like that. And took that with me and went home. And this was like right before probably two weeks or less, I would say before school started. Cause I remember starting school and not even having a lot of clothes because all I had is what I packed with me. But so it was kind of a weird summer because until all that, you know, sort of drama happened for the last few weeks of the summer, it was actually a pretty good summer. It was a pretty fun summer. And, you know, looking back on it now, I almost kind of feel bad because, you know, the whole time I lived with my dad, he was just all he ever heard was how I wanted to go home. But, you know, I think he understood that it, his wife was the reason for that. So uh, but anyway, so that that brings us to the end of the summer of 1988. So now I'm back living with my mom, so I'm happier. And now I'm living down the street from Jonathan with all of his awesome Nintendo games. And so the next, I don't know how many episodes are just gonna be us talking about, you know, sixth grade and seventh grade and mostly playing games at Jonathan's house because, um, you know, my mom didn't have a lot of money, like my, not that my dad did either, but you know, I wasn't getting video games anymore. She couldn't afford to buy me stuff like that. We rented games sometimes, but mostly I just played games at Jonathan's house. So, uh, so that's what we'll be talking about. So, um, so that's going to do it for this episode of Flashback. And thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you next time. You know, when you're a kid, at least for me... Sorry, excuse me. Really itchy. Oh.